So I would like to start off by uh, acknowledging our land. And so we at Canada Wildfire respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. And so before I start, I would just like to, to let everyone know that if they have any questions in today's webinar, just to post it in our chat box. And then at the end of our presentation today, we'll have time for a Q&A. So get all of your questions ready. And today we're uh, very pleased to present um, Dr. Patrick James of the University of Toronto in his uh, talk about insects and wildfire in the boreal forest. And Patrick is an associate professor at the Institute for Forest and Conservation with the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. His back background and expertise are in qualitative uh, ecology, forest disturbance, landscape ecology, and simulation modeling. His lab is currently studying how insect outbreaks influence fire hazard and resilience in the boreal forest and what drives spatial synchrony in outbreaks of forest pests. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Patrick and welcome him to our webinar for today. Thanks, Patrick. All right. Thank you very much for that great introduction, Sandra. I'm going to get my screen going here. Um, how's that? Yeah, that looks great. I can see it. Yeah, all good? That. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see the big crowd of people. I was recognizing names as they're coming in. And so it's, uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to speak to you today. And I'd like to really thank Canada Wildfire for the opportunity to share uh, with you our work, which I find uh, is kind of um, exciting. Uh, I'd also uh, like to acknowledge before we get going our sources of funding for this work. So um, I'm part of the uh, National Strategic Wildfire Network uh, supported through NSERC. Uh, some of this work that I'll be talking about is also supported by FRI. Uh, very grateful for their support as well as the uh, MNR in the province of Ontario. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about how do insect outbreaks affect wildfire activity? Uh, it's expressed as a question uh, for which I don't actually have um, an answer, but I hope by the end of this, we'll all be able to, to describe at least what I think or have a better understanding of what I think the problem is. And I think the problem has not been well-defined uh, in the past. Uh, for those of you who may have seen me talk about this before, you might've seen this, this comic and I, but I do enjoy it so much talking about how the mountain pine beetle can influence uh, fire risk. I also enjoy it because it talks about mutation and outbreaks, which is a topic of a separate presentation. Uh, but, uh, you know, most importantly, I think that this appeared as a political comic um, highlights that, you know, we are aware of fires, we're aware of insects, and this sort of addresses this complex notion of an interaction, and I, and I think so does kind of effectively. So we know that Canadian forests are shaped by disturbance, okay, so it's a system that has evolved since deglaciation. Uh, many of our tree species and biodiversity are adapted to these intermittent uh, disturbances on the left. I have an image of uh, all the wildfires in Canada from 1980 to 2000 that were larger than 200 hectares. So we see this huge swath of the boreal forest that's been affected by wildfire. And on the right, we can see the species ranges of some of the main uh, forest insect pests across Canada. So in the, the darker blue that's in behind, we've got the Eastern spruce budworm, perhaps the most well-known uh, forest insect pest, which has a range that extends all the way from Alaska to Newfoundland. It's a real, really well-adapted boreal species, prefers balsam fir and white spruce, can feed on black spruce, and has these super complicated, uh, and, and I, I would argue fascinating, uh, periodic outbreaks that every once in a while appear and devastate millions of, of hectares of, of forest. And my interest in forest disturbances were really initially started with my fascination with the spatial and temporal patterns of forest insect outbreaks. So there's the Eastern Spruce Budworm overlaid over that is the, the Jack Pine Budworm, uh, which is a very similar species to the Spruce Budworm that prefers to feed on, on Jack Pine. It also has a very extensive range across much of Central and Eastern Canada. In the West, there are a few other species that that don't have as uh, extensive a range, but can still have important influences on the forest and by extension, potentially 
wildfire risk. There's Western spruce budworm, which has been looked at a fair bit in the mountainous regions. Uh, two year cycle, sort of a mysterious uh, coastal budworm species, ORE, which is not as well uh, taxonomically defined, but but you know, it, it occupies a similar niche. So what I like about putting these figures beside each other is that you can see the overlap between the, the range of these outbreaking forest insect pests um, and the, the extent of, of where, or the, the habitat range of wildfire in Canada. Okay, and of course, I'd be remiss not to talk about uh, the mountain pine beetle as well. Uh, just this figure didn't include the range of the mountain pine beetle, but of course it's in the western U.S. and western Canada um, and moving moving eastward through Alberta and causing large changes to, to forest landscape structure or did cause significant changes to the to structure um, uh, in the recent decades. So these disturbances overlap, they interact with one another, although we've spent a lot more time focusing on how each one of these disturbances behaves individually. Uh, so I'd argue that these disturbances are disturbing. Uh, fire and insect activity are both expected to change, uh, are changing due to climate change. Um, these changes are expected to influence for succession, growth, yield, ecosystem services, and public safety. And we've seen lots of significant examples of the risks to, to, to public safety recently with evacuation challenges with some of the large wildfires in, in Western Canada in particular. So the punchline here is that these cumulative, or the, the punchline being what I am fascinated by is the, the cumulative and interactive effects of these changes on resilience remain uncertain. And, and I highlight resilience here because we can use this term to refer to forest ecosystem health. So the ability of forest ecosystems to absorb these disturbances and continue to provide uh, the services on which we, we depend. But I would extend this, and this is uh, sort of a, a newer domain for me to, to stretch this perspective into, but the resilience can apply to, to our human uh, social economic systems as well. How resilient are these systems to, to handle these massive wildfires um, and, and bounce back and rebuild and, and, and continue uh, doing what we would like to be doing? And the challenge here is that, that the effects of individual disturbances are likely to be greater than the sum of their parts. So instead of an additive effect, you know, what we can expect is a, is a multiplicative effect. And what's What's interesting is that we, we actually don't have a great understanding of how individual disturbances are being influenced by climate change. So we know that fire is changing in frequency and extent. We know that insect outbreaks are changing, but there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what this will look like in the future as the spatial and temporal patterns of drought and fuels uh, and human management capacities are affected by climate change. So we're kind of, we're operating in the dark a little bit in future forecasts of disturbance dynamics. And so this question of how will they then influence one another? What are the reciprocal and dynamic feedbacks between landscape structure and multiple disturbances? That remains you know, quite unclear. And, and this sort of a concept uh, can be expressed with one of these well-known ball and cup diagrams, sort of uh, Buzz Holling-esque, where we've got these different stable states and we can have you know, uh, this, this ball, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, maybe I'll switch to the pen. Right, so we've got this, this ball and this is a stable state. This is some sort of state space and a disturbance occurs and it can push this ball up over this threshold. If the disturbance is minor, it falls back and it rests in that stable state. If the disturbance is significant enough, it crests this, this, this barrier and we'll, we'll end up in this alternate state. And so the probability of this, this system shifting from one state to another, you know, is a function of the disturbance magnitude. So here listed are, are disturbances A and B, which each have their own independent effect. The additive effect, you know, would just be the combined of the two. And what, what is of concern or what a lot of theories suggest right now is that, that what we have instead of an additive or a linear combination, a linear cumulative effect, we could have some sort of interactive or, or multiplicative effect where the size of this vector will be much larger than expected than considering each one on their own and would push this into another state. So that's that's a bit of a, a, a complex way of expressing this idea. I, I did find a, a simpler version of this. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me. It's the have to pee, have to sneeze graph where each one of these things on their own is fine, but when the two of them occur at the same time, uh, there's a problem. So this, this question of how forest insect outbreaks uh, influence fire hazard, it's, it's not a new concern. Uh, Graham and Orr uh, talked about the increased fire hazard following spruce bottom outbreaks back in 1940. So here we are, you know, uh, 80, 
odd years uh, into the future. And we're still talking about these ideas. Um, and I like how he expressed this, you know, the, the jack straws, so the pickup stick scenario. Uh, and the emphasis here was on the, the difficulty of controlling the fire. And, and, you know, it's worth noting, it's not about ignition um, and it wasn't about spatial extent. Uh, it was about uh, how we control that fire or the containment capacity. And I'll, I'll come back and talk to this notion of, of containment uh, in, a, in a little bit. But, you know, this is a question that, that we've been interested in for a very long time, and it, and it continues to occupy our imagination. Um, and I think, I think we're at a unique point in sort of this scientific academic trajectory to start to ask these questions in, in a bit more detail. But it is a, a, a noisy and, and really uncertain system, um, which might account for the long time it's taken to come to any strong resolution. And the combinations of these disturbances are rare events, right? And it's difficult to identify uh, uh, a combination of these events under the same ecological context such that you could have replication in comparison. So we're sort of chasing something that's difficult to see um, and certainly seems uh, less perhaps relevant than examining the individual disturbances on their own because each is fascinating in its, in its own right. So I, I suppose to summarize that we've got limited replication and control in investigating how insect outbreaks influence fire. So we do have a formalization of these relationships. Of course, the Canadian FPP system recognizes these different fuel classes, the M3 and M4, with mixtures of, of live and, and dead uh, fur as a consequence of spruce budworm outbreaks. But however, we know little about how these change through time. And, and we also are aware that, that there is a lot of spatial variation in the ways in which stand structure is influenced by the outbreaks. Um, and I, I can summarize a little bit of this. There's a huge range of inconsistent findings in how insects affect wildfire. And, and just looking at, at the spruce budworm question, so we had some work, there was some work that was done in the Cape Breton Highlands and found no influence of fire hazard. Um, Rich Fleming with the CFS in, here in Ontario found uh, a significant interaction between insects and fire. Looking at Western spruce budworm, there was no effect taking a dendrochronological approach. Uh, again, Western spruce budworm, Heather Lynch and Paul Moorcroft found a decrease in fire risk following insect outbreak, which was interesting. Uh, Brian Stocks in Ontario, there was an increase in some work that we did. We found both an increase and a decrease depending on the temporal scale uh, we were examining it. So it's a real uh, a real mixed bag here of results. There's very little consistency. And I'd, I'd highlight here that some of that might be due to spatial variation, as I, as I alluded to a moment ago, but also the way in which the, the study is being undertaken and, and the specific response variable being investigated. You know, we can see this as well when considering mountain pine beetle. I'm going to talk more detail about the variety of, of responses or, or studies on mountain pine beetle fire interactions in a little bit. But, you know, again, there's, there's inconsistency in the findings. There is a lack of consensus around how uh, forest insects and here mountain pine beetle influences fire hazards. We've got these different response variables, and that's one of my hypotheses or one of the questions I'm interested in exploring is, are we finding these different results because of, you know, they're all actually different questions. They're not the same. Question. So it's not surprising that we find different results. We've got area burned, severity, severity, uh, probability of active crown fire. So perhaps it's that when you ask a different question, you get you get a different answer. And I, I'll go into a bit more detail on this in a little bit. So there is this broad range of results. People are interested in these questions. There's a lot in the literature. Um, and I'll, I'll do a little uh, a little plug for a couple of papers that I was involved in recently. We, we with Chris Fedig as a as our lead. Uh, we published this review of fire and insect interactions in North American forests that, that tries to uh, integrate sort of the state of the art of our understanding and the different scales at which we might be identifying uh, meaningful or, or not meaningful interactions between disturbances. Um, and also uh, with, with some folks in uh, Barcelona and Spain, Kim Canales led by Louis Brotons, uh, we reviewed some of the, the ways in which insect pests interact with other disturbances at a global scale. And really, one of the, the main points of this second article was um, how important it is for us to employ simulation modeling approaches to ask these questions because, um, uh, because of how limited our opportunities are for meaningful replication when asking these questions. Um, and indeed, when I when I started thinking about these questions uh, a long time ago, I was interested in uh, large scale landscape simulation modeling of fire insect outbreaks or fire insect interactions. And so I had this I was working with this really exciting simulation platform and the spatial model. And there are a couple of maps shown here. And this is about 
um, 400,000 hectares. Uh, each pixel in the map was about a quarter hectare. And so we could develop spatial modules that would uh, create defoliation across the landscape following a bunch of rules. We could code up fuels as FPP sort of classes and, and in, uh, have them interface with ISI and, or initial spread indices and rates of spread and produce different fire shapes as a consequence of the insect outbreak. And when we did this work, we found actually no, no effect whatsoever of, of insects on, on the fire regime. And so this was, this was very curious and, and I was never entirely satisfied with how we were able to model the connection between the two. We were using the M3, M4 fuel classes and there's nothing wrong with those. They were excellent, but I always felt, or at the time I felt there was some mechanistic uh, link that we weren't quite capturing. And whether that was on the insect side, the fire side, or specifically on the, the, the fuel, the landscape structure side, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure. So this was the first foray. And, and indeed, you know, there's a lot more detail at a finer scale and, and I'm sort of, telling you my the arc of my experience with thinking about these ideas. Um, and so as I dug into the literature more, I was finding this work by, by Brian Stocks and, and others about you know, how trees killed by the spruce budroom represent an increased fire hazard, but this effect varies between seasons, regionally, and with time since defoliation. And, and what's shown here is a, is a conceptual model that, that Brian Stocks created where we've got years since mortality and the fire potential We've got a spring fire curve and a summer fire curve, um, sort of driven by the percent of crown breakage, assuming that you get this crown breakage and then there's greater, greater ladder, ladder fuel. So there's a huge amount of nuance and subtlety to the within stand structural changes following an outbreak uh, that I don't think we were accurately capturing when we took our, our large scale simulation approach. Um, and you know this, this conceptual model is being developed further. This is some work by Graham Watt. Um, where you know, we can start to conceptualize how the time since defoliation onset, and this is this, this temporal component that's so essential, influences the way that, that the stand collapses and the fuels uh, accumulate. And so we've got this zero to 12 years, four year chunks, how the stand looks different. And these, these arrows represent different quantities one can manage, or pardon me, one can measure in a stand uh, to describe stand structure following, following the outbreak. Um, and what I would what I would posit is that this this chrono sequence is, is great, but it, it may behave uh, very differently in different circumstances in different areas of Canada under different uh, precipitation and temperature regimes. And there's also this bottom up pressure that's not indicated here of the the undergrowth that comes up, or um, as uh, as I heard Mike Watton describe it recently as the anti fuel that can come up into the understory. And so there are these competing processes that are going to influence you know, the amount of fine fuel abundance and the vertical connectivity in, in these stands. So um, I've become quite fascinated with these finer scale, scale details uh, and, and realized that it's not quite so straightforward or cut and dried how insects affect wildfire. And so when I, when I began thinking about insects and wildfire, this is sort of the conceptual model I had in my brain. Um, and then I, I realized that actually the question of how do insects affect wildfire isn't a great question um, and it can be refined quite a bit more. And it's everything is moderated by fuel structure, forest structure and fuels and how they change through time. So this is, this is the, the nuance that I think is, is required. And this is understanding insects and wildfire is understanding <clears throat> fuels. And of course, there's all this additional complexity with regards to all of these components in this little triangle of interactions. When we talk about insects, you know, what is it about the insects that we expect to be influencing forest structure and fuels? Forest insect outbreaks are complex and, and, and they vary among species quite a bit and among location. So we can talk about outbreak duration, frequency, severity, uh, the species on which they're, they're feeding, the feeding syndrome. Um, so for example, the difference between a mountain pine beetle cortical feeder under the bark versus a defoliator like spruce budworm, which consumes the, the needles, the foliage, uh, the degree of specificity and the spatial scale of, of the insect outbreak. And, and likewise, and I'm sure most of you are aware of the, the different ways one can quantify wildfire, uh, but if you're asking about how fuels are influencing wildfire, are you talking about ignition, the size, the rate of spread, the severity, its overall difficulty or, or the challenges it poses to containment? And then the forest structure itself uh, can be captured and quantified in a whole bunch of different ways. So time since outbreak, the abundance, connectivity, humidity, structure, species, successional dynamics. And so when I go back to, or if I, 
encourage you to think about those lists of papers and the, the varied responses we found. You know, you could pick, pick one from each of these categories and every paper might produce a somewhat different result. So there's a lot of variation, a lot of ways to, to, to characterize this problem and, and to you know, operationalize it in a, in a research framework. And of course, everything is, is shaped and influenced by climate and weather. And you know, we're just this one component of the fire triangle of weather, fuels, and topography. Um, and I, I highlight wildfire here in blue to go with climate and weather to show that you know, wildfire is very strongly shaped by, by, by weather. And you know, it might even be true that under, I suspect it is true that under certain weather conditions, the influence of the fuels driven by insects has no consequence on the, the fire dynamics. Like you'd be chasing too marginal a proportion of variation in that, that, that wildfire measure under high fire weather conditions. Um, so this is the framework with which we are currently working in trying to dissect uh, the ways in which uh, forest insect outbreaks might be influencing wildfire. And then in the context of this framework, what I'm going to do next, I have a few uh, current projects led by, by graduate students and postdocs in the lab that I'm going to do my best to summarize for you. So the, the first project uh, I'll be sharing is uh, this work on a mountain pine beetle fire and, and a, a scoping review that we've undertaken and sort of really squaring up to that problem of the lack of consensus among research results presently in the literature. So this is work that's uh, been undertaken by uh, Sophie Wilkinson, who's a postdoc in the lab, and Doriana Romaldi, who's a master's student. Um, and so they had this, they set out with this initial goal of, of trying to resolve some of the uncertainty um, in the mountain pine beetle fire interactions as described in the literature. So they, they took the opportunity to comb through the published literature and find all these papers that are looking at mountain pine beetle and fire and, and try to summarize the evidence on what's going on and, and try to model in a way what are the factors that determine the probability of finding a positive, negative, or a, a neutral result. And with this, uh, ideally, uh, describe knowledge gaps and, and future research priorities. So just to summarize, they, they wanted to explore this lack of consensus and try to characterize why some studies find a positive, negative, or, or, or neutral response. And so they, they took on the challenge of uh, going through the peer-reviewed literature on mountain pine beetle on wildfire behavior in North America. And uh, a classification scheme was developed with 14 categories with a total of 48 variables. And so these classifiers were used to classify each one of the publications that were identified that addressed mountain pine beetle fire interactions. And so here's the, you know, a subset of those classifiers dealing with things like fire response. Was it severity, intensity, or ignition? What was the method of study? Was it a simulation? Was it an empirical study? Were fuels considered? At what spatial scale was the study conducted? Is it a landscape or a stand level study? How was fire weather included? Time since beetle stage, the intensity, uh, and ecoregion. Okay, and then finally, each one was classified as being a positive, negative, or a, a neutral NA response. Um, in total, there were, there were 27 papers that were identified. Uh, some were removed from potential consideration due to, to controversy. So some papers had a lot of back and forth with, with other, um, other researchers sort of questioning their methods. So we removed some of those papers. Um, and we, we reduced our set to uh, a subset of, of papers that only address severity and intensity. And we were able to find that like the majority of the papers we were looking at were examining severity and intensity. And, and what I'm showing you with this table here is just an example, like quite a cartoon example of what the database looked like. So we had each article, our author, year, name, and all that, the response metric. And then we had these columns and they were all binary columns. To, to do this analysis, we sort of created these series of dummy variables. Um, and as I said, we focused only on severity and intensity. So we eliminated papers that were dealing with things like extent and ignition. And in the end, we had a total of 19 papers and 24 responses in this final analysis. Um, and the reason the number of responses is different than the number of papers is that some papers reported both a positive and a negative response or a positive and a neutral response. And these were coded, coded up separately. So we had this matrix of data and then our objective was try to identify uh, or characterize why they differed in these positive, negative, or, or neutral response on the basis of these classifiers. Um, and my, my initial hypothesis, 
was that there was something spatial going on. I was really expecting that, uh, you know, well, maybe it's the Southwest, it's all positive up North, it's all neutral, um, or that there would be some other spatial structure to these patterns. So here I've, well, uh, Doriana has put together this wonderful map uh, illustrating the, the approximate geographic location of each of these studies across Western North America. And then they're color coded with whether they found a negative in blue, neutral and yellow or positive as in amplified fire behavior as a consequence of Mount Pine Beetle um, uh, across, across the study area. And, you know, my hypothesis initially was that there was going to be some spatial structure, but there doesn't seem to be any. It's, it's really spread out all over the place. And what I also find interesting about this is that there's this partitioning. There isn't like a clustering too much. Uh, whether this is researchers identifying separate areas to study sort of their own backyard or study areas, but there is this interesting partitioning. We don't have a lot of overlap, but a lot of areas been covered. So there, there seems to be this geographic niche in terms of these mountain pine beetle fire studies. Um, worth noting is that there, there is a dearth of studies in, uh, in Canada in the Montaigne Cordillera um, and the areas affected by the mountain pine beetle in, in British Columbia. And this is, this is of particular interest because I'm very curious about how how the fire behavior in BC might influence uh, Mount Pine Beetle fire interactions in the foothills in Alberta. So we don't have a lot to build from in a similar, similar zone. Found some interesting variation also between empirical and modeling studies. So this is just a frequency histogram of the papers. Down here at the bottom, this is two, uh, two categories for intensity. So studies that looked at fire intensity, one looking at intensity measured empirically and one looking at intensity modeled. So here you can see we had two papers that found a positive response and one that found a neutral response in terms of empirical measurement. The modeling studies found many positive studies as well, also a handful of negative results. Similarly, looking at, at severity, uh, severity was split among all three. Uh, and modeled severity found only negative or positive results. So, you know, one of the things we were hoping for, in addition to that spatial hypothesis, was that, well, perhaps this is a modeling uh, uh, empirical sort of divide. Uh, that doesn't seem to be borne out, but there are still certain differences between these studies. So um, I think this is related to some of the scaling between empirical or landscape level studies and the scale at which the, the models are, are undertaken. And where we were going to as we constructed this table of classifiers is, is, you know, as a community ecologist at heart, I was sort of visualizing this as a ordination type of problem, multivariate analysis. So you can imagine this table of papers and classifiers, we throw that into an ordination. And then again, my hypothesis would be we'd get these nice clusters of, of red sites and blue sites and yellow sites. Um, and and that's, that's not what we found. We found a little bit of distinction for the neutral sites, pardon me, neutral studies which sort of came out on their own. There were fewer of those studies, uh, but there was significant overlap between the positive and negative polygons or the distribution of the papers uh, that found both negative and positive results. And this ordination space was you know, loosely broken up into a, the first axis being based on fuels, wind, and connectivity, and the second axis being relative humidity, temperature, and post mountain pine beetle stage. Um, but you know, all of these vectors here indicate uh, variables that were significant in creating this ordination ordination space. Uh, so yeah, it was a bit less um, clear than I'd hoped or expected. Uh, and uh, Sophie and Doriana have been very patient uh, going back and forth about this, trying to find a good representation. But this, this is, I think, the best representation we can have is that there's something a bit distinct about studies that identify a neutral response, but it is difficult to characterize the negative and the positive or distinguish those. Uh, but it does seem to be related in some way to, to fuels and, and connectivity. So we took one last step uh, to build a, a multi-class classification tree. And so we go from that, that sort of gory complexity of that PCA biplot uh, to this quite nice and, and parsimonious uh, classification tree uh, that was constructed using the exact same data. In the end, there were only two splits to the tree that were significant. And the two predictors that came out as relevant were relative humidity and uh, red stage. Um, so this first split on relative humidity, and I'll point out this isn't, this isn't um, a specific RH value of 0.5. This has to do with 
uh, whether the study included this as a consideration or as a predictor in their model. Was it included? So studies that, that included relative humidity tended to find neutral responses. Those that did not, if they uh, were in a red stage, um, if they were in a red stage, it was a positive response, increased fire activity, and otherwise it was a negative response. And I think I summarized that here a little bit. Right, so uh, relative humidity, like focused on fire weather, neutral response, uh, red stage, positive, uh, lack of red stage, gray, dead, green, you were getting this negative response. And, you know, I, I was I was really hoping that we'd have a bit more of a complex tree. I, I found this a little dissatisfying with just the two splits, but, um, you know, after verifying this is a, this is the best model we can produce using the data and the classification we put together and the overall accuracy, it's not, it's not stunning, like classifying the different papers, but it was uh, on average about 71% uh, which which is reasonable. So so this was this was interesting. So what our, our main takeaways from this here is that that yeah okay red stands are associated with increased fire intensity and severity. It's not a slam dunk, but we can see some of these trends. Um, the scale of the study fuels and the inclusion of weather also contribute to these contrasting responses. Um, and it suggests that as we go into the future, if you are considering a study, an empirical study or a simulation study on the role of insect outbreaks on fire activity. Um, you know, you, being explicit about the different uh, environmental context, the weather context, the fire weather context, uh, as well as the fuels is, is going to be important to tease these out because I think they can interact and they can also mask one another. Um, and it can be difficult to see where the cause and effect, where the cause and effect is. And, and this is, this is a, a photo that was uh, contributed by, by Doriana, grad student in the lab again, showing uh, a stand in Jasper that has been affected by mountain pine beetle. I don't think this is an area that's being affected by their current fires. Um, but but I think what, what we like about this image is it evokes the role of fuels as well as this sort of ominous role of, of weather. So that's that's our, our effort to sort of reconcile some of the uncertainty in the literature between uh, mountain pine beetle and fire. Um, I'd like to talk now a little bit about another ongoing project uh, related to fuel succession post defoliator. So this is the other feeding syndrome uh, with the Mount Pine Beetle and, and Jack Pine Budworm. So in Eastern Canada, we, we've got quite a bit of activity of defoliators. Uh, in the green here is the spatial extent of the spruce budworm outbreak in Quebec and Ontario. And in the orange is the spatial extent of the Jack Pine budworm outbreak in 2020. Jack pine budroom outbreak seems to have collapsed um, since this image was generated. The 2021 data isn't terribly useful or reliable because a lot of the a lot of the the view of those who survey this land it was occluded by smoke from last year's fire season. So we don't really have a good idea of of the jack pine budroom spatial extent from last year. But the the spruce budroom outbreak is also beginning to collapse, uh, sort of starting to contract. Uh, we don't have the information for New Brunswick, but there is a little bit of action in here as well as as well as in Maine. So these are huge uh, areas that are affected by insects. And well, we've got these the fires in 2020 are indicated by these little red guys. So you know, in terms of area affected, the insects definitely win for for 2020. So we're curious about what is what does it mean these huge areas affected by these insect outbreaks and presumably affected stand structure? What does that mean for for fire hazard? And so the specific question in this context relates to, you know, how does how does uh, jack pine budroom defoliation and spruce budroom defoliation uh, influence within stand fuel abundance and connectivity? Uh, do these changes in fuel structure affect fire activity? And what is the time lag between defoliation and alter, altered fuel structure and, and fire hazard? Um, and I've been really fortunate to work with a great team of students again in the lab, uh, led right now by by Frank Gandiaga, who's a, a postdoc in the lab, Kennedy Pocola, who's a a PhD student and a, a new recruit to the team, Leo Jordan, who's a computer science major who's helping us with, with some data stuff. So we have these, these questions about what is the relationship between defoliation and, uh, and fire and fuel abundance. And so the sort of conceptual model that we're looking at is, you know, we, on the x-axis here, we've got years since defoliation or mortality. Um, and it's worth noting that different studies use uh, defoliation and others use mortality as the time at which fuel structures begin to change. Um, and so they can be they can be different and that would produce different results as you quantify insect activity. And so we just got this sort of conceptual curve. Okay, so how does the probability of fire, you know, say it's ignition, uh, given a whole bunch of weather variables, how does it change through time? 
And, and But maybe this curve doesn't look like this. Maybe there's a lag and there's a peak later. Maybe it's even later. What is this lag? What is this lag time between the outbreak and the, the uh, actual physical changing of biohazard on the landscape? And, and what we're hypothesizing here is that this is related to, to fuel abundance and, and connectivity. And so to measure the, the fuel abundance and connectivity, we're using um, terrestrial LIDAR. Uh, and so terrestrial LIDAR, it's a technique where, and I won't go into too much detail because I believe next month's webinar uh, presented by Laura Chasmer will go into much more detail um, and much more effective detail on, on terrestrial LIDAR scanning. But it's a device, this is the device here, that allows us to create a 3D model of our forest stand. And from that, we can extract metrics that can summarize the abundance and connectivity of, of fuels. And so this summer and last, we visited a selection of jack pine and balsam fir stands in Ontario. Uh, our objective was to, we selected these stands based on historical outbreak data to create a chrono sequence of stands with different times since the initiation of defoliation. And so we can't, well, the lifespan of a grad student is such that we, they can't stay in the lab for 10 years measuring annually to get that whole arc. And so what we're trying to do is assemble different sites from different areas that have been affected at different times to sort of build that time series in a shorter amount of time. Uh, we scanned these sites using our TLS. It's a, it's a Leica BLK360. We did four replicates per site. Each site involved nine scans and multiple scans have to occur in a stand to, to overcome the issues of occlusion or the way in which a tree stem might block the imagery behind it. So you do multiple, stand, multiple scans to assemble a more integrated um, image. And we followed the, the protocol that has been developed by the CFS, the Next Generation Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System, protocol developed by John Boucher in Quebec. And when we run these scans, we can produce these cool images. And I'm a, a bit of a newbie yet to this technology, but uh, there are these wonderful three-dimensional images. Each one is a point, so it's billions of points in space that can be used to reconstruct stand structure, okay? And from this virtual version of our stand, we can apply other methods to extract information. And in this image, you can sort of see our little tripod here that was in the, in the stand, okay? That was used to orient the multiple images and stitch them together. And it is wonderful and we can produce a whole bunch of data, but it remains a bit of a challenge as to what, what we do with it. There are some techniques that are standard, but not all meet our, our needs. Um, and what was interesting in speaking with the Leica representatives who are helping us set up this technology, uh, they initially explicitly told us that you should not use this in the forest. This is not what it's designed for. It's for um, architecture purposes, interior buildings design, uh, and was fascinated with uh, what we were attempting to do. And they ended up being quite helpful in helping us design our protocols to get the most out of this, this piece of technology. So one of the steps we're taking right now to extract information from all of this data is to take these point clouds and we, we convert them into voxels. So there's this process of voxelization where we divide that space, that three-dimensional space that's occupied by all the points into a series of stacked cubes. And then we count the number of points that fall within each cube. Okay, so this is this voxelization, it's three-dimensional pixel. And then our goal currently is to compare the vertical distribution of biomass to get a sense of how how the, the vertical abundance and perhaps the connectivity between surface and crown changes with time since outbreak. And so this is, this is an example at the, the scale of an individual tree, uh, whereas what we're working with is at the scale of an entire stand. So here's, here's a point cloud for an individual tree, and here's the visualization of how we convert it to a series of, of voxels um, and summarize the information within them. And then we can take these voxels and we can summarize the density of those voxels. So the amount of biomass going vertically. And what we'd expect is that as time progresses from the outbreak, we'd expect a bit of a slumping of our biomass um, as, as biomass is effectively transferred towards the uh, forest floor because of the action of the insect outbreak. Um, and we have some initial results uh, that are, are contradictory to our hypothesis. So these are two stands um, near Kenora. So the stand that has been affected for only one year by Jack Pine Budroom has this profile. So it's got this, has a greater amount of biomass near the floor, uh, whereas the stand, which has been affected for two years, has this different structure and a bit more biomass up top. So we're, 
Uh, we were a bit surprised that we're not finding exactly what we expected, but it is only two stands. And uh, I included here not to show you that all of our hypotheses are, are bad, but to show you just a sense of what some of this, this data looks like and, and what we're working with. And what we hope is that once we begin to integrate more samples and more variability uh, and develop techniques to statistically compare these types of curves, and then as far as I know, we don't have uh, sort of plug and play methods to assess statistical significance or the statistical difference between curves like this. Um, yes, and, and so that, that's, that's where we will be going next with this. And then uh, beyond comparing these curves, uh, there are many other really fascinating avenues to explore with these three-dimensional stacks of cubes. And I'm, with a background in spatial analysis, I, I'm very fascinated by these challenges. And so you, could, you can imagine this three-dimensional stack and there are methods that one can borrow we're looking into that are used for medical imaging. So often people who do functional MRIs produce three-dimensional images of the human brain and voxelize it and find techniques to identify patterns. So I think it's a really rich area, a really rich opportunity for us to borrow other techniques. There's also a very uh, exciting areas that are developing uh, landscape pattern metrics. Some of you may be aware of sort of a landscape ecology tradition of, of characterizing landscape patterns on two-dimensional raster maps. And some of those metrics are being expanded to be, uh, to be applied to three-dimensional uh, volumes of cubes uh, like the one represented here. The, uh, the final project I'd like to share with you today is some work on fire escape and containment um, and the ways in which uh, spruce budworm outbreaks may influence uh, our ability to contain wildfires. So this is work that's being undertaken by, by Kennedy. Kennedy was also involved in the previous project. She's got a, a diverse thesis. So she's the lead on this and has been looking at how, how the, the changes in fuels wrought by spruce budworm outbreaks can influence wildfire behavior. Uh, and she has background as a wildland fire ranger, and she's been very interested in, in initial attack. And we've been, been examining this question of, of how is initial attack affected by the legacies of the insect outbreaks. And here initial attack is defined as the initial action taken. Uh, to limit or stop the spread of a wildfire. Um, and the unit of analysis here is those fires that escape or initial attack failures. And here we've defined those as, as fires that have a final size greater than the size of the attack. And I underline it and I asterisk it uh, because we know that there are different definitions of uh, escape. And Kennedy is grinding through uh, the sensitivity of her approaches or, or, or looking at sensitivity analysis of her approaches how they vary with the type of definition you use. But for right now, the one that we've landed on that we seem to be going forward with is this notion of zero growth, um, uh, helping us define and, and escape. And so the specific question is, how does spruce bugroom defoliation affect the probability of, of a wildfire escaping IA? Uh, we've taken a random forest model approach for this problem as well. And here the response are uh, Ontario fires classified as contained or escaped from 1990 to 2000. That gives us about 30,000 fires, uh, just under 7,000 of which are classified as escaped. Then into the model, we pour a whack of predictors. We've got all the FWI indices, size at IA, cause, season, uh, ecoregion. Um, and then of course, we wanted to include this SBW or insect defoliation history. Uh, and this is a really difficult, it's, it's a difficult predictor to include because it involves a couple of different dimensions. Um, so because it occurs through time, you can ask the question of, well, when was the last time defoliation was detected? So that's the time since defoliation. But that doesn't capture any of the intensity of the outbreak, which one might measure by adding up the number of consecutive years in the past that the uh, stand was affected. So in a way, uh, outbreak history can be defined in, in a two-dimensional space where time since and intensity. Uh, and so in an effort to sort of integrate those two components, uh, we've again taken a bit of an ordination approach where we developed a, a, a database for each fire. So here each row is a fire and each column is a, a binary variable of whether that fire occurred on an area affected by spruce budworm at a lag of year one, at a lag of year two, at a lag of year three, et cetera, going back. And I think this is calculated back to 15 years. And I show you a truncated version here. So again, we've got this site by species matrix, which can be, which can be ordinated and uh, uh, projected into two dimensional space. Uh, so here we have an example ordination. These vectors are each of these classifiers again for each fire. Uh, 
And I added these circles here. They represent just, just fictional fires. They fall out somewhere in that ordination space. And then we've got these axes, principal component one, principal component two, which you know the, the coordinates for each of these points can then be used as a predictor in the model because they capture both uh, the time since the outbreak occurred as well as how intense it was. So this is this is sort of a novel way to approach uh, including defoliation history into a model, and and uh, we, we seem to be having a bit of success with it so far. So the main finding is that we do find that. Uh, models that include historical spruce bottom defoliation were more overall more accurate, were better able to predict whether a model was going to escape or not. And so there's a handful of different types of accuracy metrics one can use. Um, and consistently, the spruce bottom model uh, performed better than the model that did not include spruce bottom variables. Now, these are all quite marginal improvements, but they are improvements nonetheless. For all models, though, the fire size at initial attack was the most important predictor of containment success. And that's that's not shocking and um, seems rather intuitive. And, and I think I think it highlights kind of the success of this approach in identifying a marginal improvement with spruce butterworm defoliation, even in the context of how important fire size at initial attack is as a predictor of containment success. Uh, and sort of this challenge, this interesting challenge is there is this reciprocal feedback, this relationship we hypothesize between fire size and budroom defoliation. So there's this nested question then of how does budroom defoliation then influence uh, either rate of spread or how large a fire gets to prior to it being actioned. And of course, there are many other factors that, that determine that. And we're working on, on quantifying those and including them into the, the model. Um, and so a possible next step in this area would be to reframe the problem in a bit of a structural equation modeling framework, which allows sort of multiple relationships between predictors rather than sort of independent relationships between each predictor and the, the response variable. Um, and if I'm not sure if Kennedy knows that that's what I'm proposing for us to do, but if she's listening, I, I look forward to talking about it more. And so the, the main takeaway from this study here is that we do find some support for our hypothesis that defoliation affects containment success. Um, and the effects of defoliation on initial size rate of spread require uh, further examination and we hope to continue to develop this program and include other predictors and fold it into management planning in a way that it might help uh, model model risk um, and guide allocation of, of resources. So that is uh, everything I had to talk about today. I want to end with showing you uh, the picture of the spruce budroom, one of these critters in question. Um, and I, what I find so great about, about studying these systems is there are these tiny insects. So this is a very small spruce budroom that maybe is half an inch long. And right now he's hanging from one of his threads. Um, a mountain pine beetle, of course, slightly larger than a grain of rice. Uh, they can scale up to these landscape level effects and uh, we believe can have an influence on other disturbances. And so understanding these outbreak dynamics in the Canadian forest from a a multidisciplinary integrated perspective, I think is essential for us to go forward and understand uh, what these forests are going to look like and how resilient they will be and how resilient human systems uh, will be in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Patrick. That's wonderful, um, fantastic work your team is doing. Um, thanks for joining us today. And we do have a couple of questions here. So I'll start with, um, the first one from Marty, and his uh, question is, what about issues around the uh, spruce beetle? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, it's it's a great question. I have not had the opportunity to to look too much at the spruce beetle. I know that, that Marc-Andre at the CFS at Northern is, is looking at that a little bit, and, and I'm interested in looking at it further. And I think that um, it, it, will, it will depend on you know, how does that insect affect forest structure? I don't know much about its ecology in particular, but I think I think that it might be distinct. It's cortical feeder as well. So you'd expect something maybe similar to what the mountain pine beetle does, uh, but it the intensity and the extent of those outbreaks are a bit different. Um, I'd be super interested in digging through some of those data and uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a, a next one of the next steps. And I don't mean to didn't mean to shirk the spruce beetle at all with this with this study. It's just not one I'm as familiar with. Perfect. Thanks, Patrick. Um, his second question is in the containment st study, what about the importance of season as found by stocks 1987? 
yeah, so season is in that model. Um, and I think it, it there is a split in the model that influences that is driven by season. So we get sort of different dynamics in the spring and the summer. Uh, I can't recall exactly what those were, but the regardless of the season, it seemed like size of initial attack came out as the most important. So season is further down the, the line, but size of initial attack remains most important. Oh, that's great. Okay, thank you for answering his question. Um, the next question is from Baburam, and he says, great work. Referring to your slide 14, did you apply a two-way feedback loop between insect and wildfire while modeling wildfire as a function of insect infection? Let me just zoom down here to the 14. Okay. Could you repeat the question for me, Sandra? Sure. So for slide 14, did you apply two-way feedback loop between insect and wildfire while modeling wildfire as a function of insect infection? So I'd say that there, there is, yeah, there's, so this, this is the conceptual model that we're talking about on, on slide 14. Um, and yeah, I think a two-way reciprocal model is, is necessary, however you approach this, because both, you know, wildfires affecting forest structure, insects are affecting forest structure, and forest structure is then influencing both wildfire and insects. So they are definitely two-way. And the, I mean, the, the relative time scales and spatial scales of those two things is one of the, the challenges because the wildfire influences vegetation relatively quickly. Um, it consumes it during the course of a fire. Uh, whereas insects and outbreak that can last 10, 12 years, it's a much slower change, a bit of a slow burn on how it influences the structure. So I would say most definitely that two-way reciprocal feedback is essential. One of the challenges, if you were to produce, um, I don't know what type of model we'd be referring to, whether it's a simulation model or a ODE model or even just a statistical model, I think having the opportunity for those two-way feedbacks is, is essential. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, we do have another question from Chris and his question is, do you have any thoughts on what the um, underlying mechanisms might be that lead to why some mountain pine beetle fire studies are finding a negative relationship or is it a dis study design issue? Yeah, so I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not interested. I, I don't think it would be fair to say that people had poor study designs or anything. I, I, I think everyone has, the papers that we've read were, were well executed and they did what they said they were going to do. I think, I think the mechanism is, is contingency or ecological context. Um, whether, and there's just so much variability in the forest. Of course, this is the challenge that we grapple with all the time when we're asking these questions. Um, so like I said, my hypothesis initially had been some sort of spatial variation or forest type, and that wasn't it. Um, and we couldn't really test the role of ecoregion because of this interesting partitioning of studies. It was almost like every study was in its own ecoregion. We don't have replication within ecoregions. I, I would say that it, I, I think it's the interaction between uh, fire weather context and the fuel context. So time since and the fuels, and it, and it comes down to how we, that, that sort of simple regression tree that we showed at the end, um, that if you're, if you're measuring in certain weather conditions, you're not going to see an effect because those effects get, the effects of the fuels are masked um, by the role of weather. Uh, and I, I think, I, yeah, I think I think it's the masking effect of weather, which which becomes more important than fuels under certain circumstances. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I do have a question for you, and um, I'm wondering if there is a point of time where infestation is no longer relative for fuel classification. Maybe generation regeneration has become more important. Yeah, yeah. So I don't. I that's that is a great question. That's kind of the question. I don't know where that inflection point is, right? And I think I think it's going to vary depending where you are. So, you know, in, in one of our studies that we did in 2017, we were looking at ignition effects of spruce budworm outbreaks in Ontario, um, and we looked at these different time legs, and we had like a model comparison approach. And what came out was there's an increase in risk of ignition about eight years after defoliation, and that was kind of consistent whether you're in the east or the west. Uh, but what, what was sort of challenging or, or was unexpected was that there was a decrease in ignition um, immediately after the outbreak, like in one year. And we don't really know what that is. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's an artifact of our approach, but our hypothesis was it was before there was a change in stand structure, like stem breakage or accumulation of, of uh, uh, ladder fuels or defined fuels, but 
the canopy was nonetheless quite a bit open, which allowed for greater insulation, or maybe the trees had died and they weren't uh, transpiring quite as much. So there was additional water and light in the understory, which allows for a flush of understory vegetation, the anti-fuel, which could dampen the probability of an ignition occurring. And this is just a hypothesis we've not yet tested. If, if anyone's looking for a master's project, I think that would be a good one. Um, but in terms of going through time, yeah, I, I don't know where that inflection would happen. And I think it does happen. And I think it's going to happen differently in different places. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, we do have another question and very roughly, the majority of area, um, or it's more of a statement, very roughly majority of area burned in BC where mountain pine beetle has occurred is in places uh, between 10 to 15 years after a mountain pine beetle work in progress. Right, yeah, Chris, that's really cool. Um, and is that, I mean, is that, do you think that that's a, a mechanism that's driving that, that the fires happen because that, or just coincidentally that ended up being the overlap and that's what we can observe right now? Let's see what he says. Uh, I'll just unmute to answer that rather than try to type the answer. I think I think it is what you were saying to my first question. It's the coincidence of the weather with the fuel condition. That that right. is the that's the thing. Is like whether it is the fuel condition or it's just that's when the weather hit the right conditions to ignite that landscape. I think it is it's a combination of the two, and it is very difficult, as you said, to tease those apart. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I'd reiterate the the importance and the opportunities for spatial simulation modeling to get at this because we can't we can't visit we can't replicate these experiments enough um, and so you know we need to take a simulation approach where we can control for all these factors at the same time. But it requires a good mechanistic model, which is difficult to get because we don't have the replication. Okay, perfect. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I don't see any more. Do you have anything else to add, uh, Patrick, um, about your work and what's next? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I, we're learning quite a bit as we go through this. Um, very excited about the potential for the uh, terrestrial laser scanning and also other aerial-based uh, LIDAR approaches. Um, and this is a big push that's happening in collaboration with, with the CFS and with the Chasmer Lab. Um, and again, next month, Laura will talk much more about it. But I think, I think there's some really interesting opportunities with that. Uh, and I think, I think there's the, the, what's exciting is the technology itself that can collect this high resolution data. Um, but I think a real brave new world in this is, is methods to extract meaningful information from that and whether that's you know, AIs to distinguish stem from foliage, which I know people in Laura's group are working on, whether it's other ways to summarize, uh, you know, stand vertical connectivity. Um, I think this is going to be a very exciting area of research and, and uh, I think the wildfire science community is going to benefit a lot or it's a great opportunity. That's terrific. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing all the results and uh, learning more about your research. Um, I thank you so much. We at Canada Wildfire, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And um, we will be posting uh, your talk on our YouTube channel probably next week. Um, I do not see any more questions here. And yes, thanks for um, announcing our next webinar, which will be on October 14th with uh, Dr. Laura Chasner of the University of Lethbridge, and it's on LIDAR. So we hope that everyone can join us next month. And uh, to those that will be attending the conference in October, we're looking forward to meeting you. Um, and I guess that's it for today then. Okay, thank you. And, and please do reach out anyone there in the audience if you have other questions or would like to discuss this, you know, always happy to, to chat about, about these ideas. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks again, Patrick, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye now.